chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Hello there, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host and narrator, Eric Peabody. And I've got a story about some corporate horror for you tonight, straight from author R.K. Combrink. The title of this story is The Sixteenth Floor. Our protagonist, Scott, is a new hire at your run-of-the-mill office, complete with cubicles, memos, and busy work. Some of Scott's said busy work involves a new task where he has to retrieve files from the sixteenth floor of the building. This floor has been vacant for several years, and Scott notices that all of his co-workers give him strange looks when he mentions it. Dauntless, Scott heads up to the 16th floor, and what he finds there is stranger than anything he could have imagined. Also, please join me in welcoming Danielle Hewitt back to the show. She'll be providing several voices for tonight's story. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author R.K. Combrink, I give you The Sixteenth Floor. Scott, can you come back here for a second? Scott looked up. He'd been reading movie reviews and was afraid that maybe his manager, Dean, had somehow caught him doing it from the computer in his office. He walked down the aisle, slipping between grey-walled cubicles, bumping his elbow against the massive printer at the end of the row. Oh, sorry, Scott said to no one as he rubbed his arm where it struck the copier. No one noticed his collision or heard his apology. Scott stepped into Dean's office, which was really just two and a half plexiglass walls screwed into the floor. Inside was a desk on rollers covered with photographs of Dean and his friends engaging in various forms of outdoor activities. There were no pictures of a wife or children, because he had neither. 
Dean was a believer in the joys of bachelorhood, or so he'd said during Scott's job interview. Scott wouldn't have said that he disliked Dean. He seemed to be a decent enough guy, and he'd been friendly so far. But there was something about him that made Scott wary. Dean reminded him of an excitable dog who might suddenly bite during a game of fetch. What's up, Dean? Scott started to lean against the doorway of Dean's office, and then, realizing how flimsy the walls were, stood up quickly, shoving his hands into his pockets. Not much, buddy, not much. Dean swiveled around in his office chair and looked up at Scott. Need you to do me a favor. All right. No hesitation. Good man. Dean leaned back in his chair. The uppers have decided they want to go paperless, which we've mostly already done, but there's a whole shitload of what we like to call the ancient files upstairs. Dean made air quotes with his fingers. Some of these files probably go back 30 years or more. There's not much reason for us to still have them, but every now and again a few of the more senior clients need a record, or somebody dies and the lawyer in charge of the estate requests one. So we want to audit them to kind of sift through and figure out which ones we really need to hold on to and which ones we can chuck. Dean picked up a coffee mug with the words De Bomb" written on the side from his desk and took a quick sip. What I need you to do is to take a list of files, go up to 16, hunt them up, and then bring them back down here and box them up for the accounts manager. Scott hoped the boredom in his voice wasn't obvious. Yeah, okay, sounds good. You want me to head on up there now? Not yet. It'll take me a while to get you a list together. Dean's friendly grin froze up a little bit. He turned toward his desk and flipped through some scattered papers. Oh, yeah, and I guess I should tell you. The 16th floor, it's, well, abandoned, I guess you'd say. There's nobody working up there and hasn't been for years. Scott nodded again. He didn't know why Dean thought it mattered to him whether or not there was anyone working on the 16th floor, but Dean went on. I guess it can <laughs> be kind of creepy up there, he chuckled, clearly embarrassed. I know that sounds stupid. I'm just saying it's a mess. I'm not sure the custodians ever actually go up there. If they do, it's not often, and some of the lights might be out. That wasn't even our office originally. It was some import business or something. We just kind of shoved the ancient files up there after they moved out. There's still a bunch of their crap laying around. Some of it's pretty weird. I've only been up there once or twice. Here he paused and took a long sip from his coffee. You should just be careful not to trip over anything or hurt yourself. I would just go get the files as quick as possible and then come on back down. We don't want this project to take more than a couple of days, okay? Dean shot him another mealy grin. Yeah, I got it. Scott was intrigued. Now he couldn't wait to get up there and start poking around. He liked old things, and he liked weird things. As a kid, he'd been an avid junk collector. He'd scrounge through thrift stores with his mom on Saturday afternoons where he'd grab up anything he could convince her to buy for him. He'd once gotten an old Underwood typewriter for $4.00. It still had a ribbon in it, and it worked for years after. He also had a set of wooden warriors, complete with a dead, speared lion, and a set of dinosaur cookie cutters. Even as an adult, he collected a few quirky odds and ends, and the prospect of going up to an abandoned office floor and hunting through a bunch of old stuff was very appealing to him. They couldn't even call it stealing if he took anything, because it hadn't belonged to his company in the first place. Scott took a step back into the main aisleway. Just let me know when you got the list together and I'll get started. Dean gave Scott a thumbs up and went back to flipping through the papers on his desk. When Scott returned from his lunch break that afternoon, there was a thin sheaf of papers, held together with a clip, waiting on his desk. It was the list of files he was supposed to bring back from upstairs. He took his jacket off and draped it over the back of his chair, and then, with list in hand, walked over to Dean's little office. Hey, Dean, I'm going on up to 16 now. Dean was at his desk with an oily Italian sub in front of him. He half turned and held up his hand for Scott to wait. 
All right, man, he said around a mouthful of half-chewed sandwich. When you get up there, get off the elevator and go to the hallway on the right. The first doorway you see is the one you want. It used to be suite 350 or something, but there's no actual door there anymore. Dean hefted his sub and took another chunk out of it. Gotcha. Scott gave a little half wave. See you in a little bit. He turned and started to walk away. He had only taken three steps when Dean called his name. Hey, Scott, listen. Dean regarded Scott solemnly. While you're up there... Yeah? Dean paused for a moment, his eyes troubled, and then breathed a tiny sigh. While you're up there, try not to goof off too much, okay? Scott chuckled. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I'll just get the files and get back down here. Dean shot him another thumbs up. Excellent. See you soon, my man. Good luck. Dean turned back to his sandwich. In the lobby, Scott's footfalls clacked and echoed off the granite floor tiles. He walked up to the elevator, pressed the button, and waited. A few moments later, there was a ding and the door opened. A young man with glasses and lanky brown hair stepped out. He had a McDonald's cup in his hand and was sucking noisily on the straw, trying to get the very last drops of soda from the bottom of the cup. Scott nodded to the soda drinker, whose name was Matt. What's going on, man? Matt disengaged his mouth from the straw. Oh, not much. Where are you headed? They passed each other as Scott stepped forward and stuck his hand in the elevator to keep the doors from closing. I'm going up to 16 to pull some old files. Matt's eyebrows went up. 16? Good luck. He shook his head as he walked into the hallway, sucking away at his drink. What the hell? Scott stepped into the elevator and let the doors close him in. He didn't really know anyone at Jarvis and Lloyd very well yet. Matt had trained him on the office computer system and was probably the person that Scott had interacted with the most, except for Dean. He made a mental note to ask Matt later what the deal was with people wishing him good luck. He reached his hand out and pushed the button marked 16. The elevator jerked upward three floors and stopped. The dinger went off and the doors opened. Scott stepped off the elevator and into the lobby. Several of the fluorescent lights were out. Many were flickering and weak. Across the lobby against the wall was a small table that held an incredibly dusty vase. The last remnants of the plants that had withered and died there hung sadly over its lip. Scott shook his head and looked to his left. A dark hallway ran perpendicular to the lobby. The electric lights along that side had gone completely dark. One small triangle of sunshine spilled out from one of the abandoned offices to cut through the gloom. A galaxy of dust motes floated gracefully in that scant burst of light. The air had a musty, forgotten smell, and silence filled all the empty spaces. Scott thought that there was no way the custodians had been up here recently. It looked to him like no one had been up here for months. Scott turned and walked into the other hallway. There were at least a couple of lights still on, but they only accentuated the neglect. There was a doorless doorway that opened into a larger, mostly unlit space. That was where Dean had said the ancient files were. On the floor, along the wall, sat the remains of a business hastily abandoned. There were cardboard boxes lined up outside the doorway in both directions. Scott leaned over and examined them. Most were filled with stacks of old papers, forms, invoices, requisitions, and the like, all with the name Midwest Imports and Artifacts printed across their tops. One of the boxes held what seemed to be random office supplies, and Scott hunkered down for a closer look. Crouching within the box were a stapler, a cup full of various pens and pencils, a couple of pocket-sized calendars, some other odds and ends, and something Scott couldn't identify. He reached in and pulled the object out. It was a small statuette about six inches tall. It looked like a naked man with the head of an owl. It had a square base and was carved from some kind of dark gray stone. It was quite heavy. 
He grinned. This was just the kind of thing he liked. He set it back in its box. He thought maybe he would retrieve it when he left. He stood back up and glanced down the hallway. It went on for a little way beyond the office, where it hooked left to meet up with the dark passage on the other side of the lobby. Halfway down, on the left-hand side, was an alcove which, based on the layouts of the other floors, Scott guessed was a restroom. There were no lights on back there. It was cavernous and forbidding somehow. He didn't think he'd be using it, no matter how badly he had to go. Sitting just outside the alcove, alone and out of place, was an old office chair. Looking at it, Scott wondered who had left it there. How long ago had that been? Hey, anybody up here? Scott wasn't expecting a response, and none was forthcoming. He stepped through the doorless entrance and into the gloom of the large suite. Weak sunlight fought its way through the grime-covered windows at the back of the office. Against the wall, as promised, were five massive filing cabinets. They were all taller than Scott and together spanned half of the length of the office. Jesus Christ, Scott thought, his gaze sweeping from one end to the other. There must be a thousand files in there. With a sigh, he consulted the list he'd been given. The first file he needed was for Wargum Allen A. There were a few squat desks scattered throughout the space, and he turned to the nearest one and set his list down on it. There was an old calendar blotter on the desk that caught his eye. It was dated from four years before. The letterhead read, Midwest Imports and Artifacts, bringing the outside world in, just like the papers in the boxes outside. There was also a Midwest Imports stick-it note resting on the blotter, its stickiness long since departed, the corners curled up like the legs of a dead bug. He looked around at the lonely outcropping of desks and chairs and tried to imagine people working here. He could almost see them, on their phones, setting appointments and trying to placate clients, walking up to the desk by the doorway to maybe pass a few flirtatious words with the pretty or so Scott imagined her, receptionist. He walked over there, his files forgotten for the moment. The reception desk sat behind a low J-shaped barrier. A few yellowed gum wrappers littered the floor beneath the desk. How appropriate, Scott thought. They had a gum-chewing receptionist. Maybe they had a wise-cracking mail carrier too. Could have made a sitcom. Suddenly, he realized that he had to pee. He temporarily put his make-believe show on hold and made his way out into the hallway. The moment he stepped out of the office, Scott felt something was wrong. He looked down the hall towards the dark and cavernous restroom. Not going in there, that's for sure, and scanned the boxes along the wall. He peered out into the elevator lobby, but he couldn't quite put his finger on what it was that was bothering him. It was a disquieting feeling, like he discovered someone was going to play a prank on him. Uh, hello? The word slipped hesitantly out of his mouth. No one answered back, and his bladder reminded him that he had places to go. He walked into the lobby and pushed the down button for the elevator. He intended to head down to the first floor, hit the restroom, and then go out to have a cigarette. After that, he'd come back up and get started on pulling those files. It was just as the elevator's bell went off that Scott realized what was different in the hallway. The chair that had been sitting by the bathroom, adrift like an empty lifeboat, was no longer there. He spun around and walked quickly back into the hall, leaving the elevator to open onto an empty lobby. He looked to where the chair had been and found only bare carpet. He peeked around the corner of the doorway into the office and didn't see it anywhere in there either. Am I sure there was a chair there in the first place? It had only been a few minutes ago, and he'd been out there examining the contents of the former Midwest Import and Artifacts Company. He remembered thinking the chair was creepy, just sitting out there as if an invisible someone had been sitting in it, watching him. The answer was yes, he was sure. All right then. 
Scott backed out of the hallway and into the lobby, feeling slightly uneasy. He stepped up to the elevator and pressed the button again, casting a look over his shoulder as he waited for it to arrive. When the bell dinged and the doors opened, Scott stepped in as quickly as he could. He pushed the first floor button repeatedly until the doors slid slowly shut. Once the elevator began its descent, he leaned against the back wall and laughed inwardly at himself. His anxiety drained away almost immediately. He was still sure there had been a chair in the hallway the first time he'd been out there, but as he sunk into the well-lit world of the lower floors, it didn't seem to matter so much. Sure, it was weird, but weird things happened all the time. No big deal. The elevator arrived at the first floor and the doors opened, letting in a flood of comforting noise. Scott stepped out and joined the mass of people coming and going. He waved to the security guard, Ray, as he passed on his way to the restroom. After relieving himself, he walked past Ray once more as he headed for the revolving door at the front of the vast foyer. The first floor lobby was the complete opposite of the one on 16. It had been remodeled a few years earlier and gleamed with shining glass and marble. Hey Ray, how's it going? Scott called as he strode past, pulling a pack of cigarettes from his shirt pocket. Uh, can't complain, Scotty, can't complain. How about yourself? Scott turned and walked backward for a moment. Not a lot, just goofing around up on 16. He turned back around and kept walking. He did not see the expression on Ray's face as it soured at the mention of the 16th floor. Twenty-five minutes and two cigarettes later, Scott found himself back upstairs in the funereal lobby on 16. He crossed the hallway and stepped into the office. The chair he'd seen outside the restrooms was still missing, and he was still puzzled by this, but pushed it from his mind. He walked over to the desk where he'd left his list and grabbed up the cluster of papers. He examined it for a moment, noted the first few file names, and then set off to find them. He walked up to the cabinet furthest to the right, muttering to himself, Wargum, Wargum. He leaned in close to the drawers, searching the labels for the right set. Where are you, buddy? He went back to his list and checked Wargum's file number, 1139. He jogged back over to the cabinets and found the drawer marked 950 to 1150. He knelt and pulled it open, gritting his teeth at the loud metal scream. In just a few seconds, he had the thick green folder in his hands. It had the same smell as the old paperbacks that Scott would get at the thrift stores with his mother, the moist, forgotten smell. He took it over to the desk with the old calendar blotter, which he was now thinking of as his desk, and dropped it next to the list, which he picked up and consulted again. Scott gathered nine more files, trotting back and forth between the cabinets and his desk. Outside the filmy windows, the sunlight began to weaken as afternoon slid casually towards dusk. A single fly buzzed unenthusiastically around the office, lighting occasionally on the relics left behind by the departed Midwest Import Company. Scott crouched in front of the second cabinet from the right. He'd just pulled Lucas and Sons Funeral, LLC, file number 1506A, he shut the rattling drawer and stood up, his knees popping. He turned around to take the file to his desk and nearly tripped over the young woman who had been standing there directly behind him. Oh, shit! He cried, startled, taking two fumbling steps backward and nearly falling. The woman, who didn't seem startled at all, watched Scott with her hands clasped behind her back, smiling like a sleepy cat. Hey, Scott said, regaining his composure. Didn't see you there. Sorry about that. He took a deep breath and smiled down at the woman. She was shorter than he was, with frosted brown hair that fell thick and curly to just above her shoulders. She had a smattering of freckles across her nose and cheeks and wore very red lipstick. She stood there, still not speaking or moving, Petite, in a white blouse and tight gray slacks. Her eyes were big and brown, and they sparkled with amusement. 
Scott thought she was cute, and he was sure he'd seen her around the building before, though he wasn't sure when or where. He reached out to shake her hand. I'm Scott, by the way. I work down on 13. His hand remained untaken, extended in space and hovering for a few long seconds while the woman smiled up at him wordlessly. Her eyes were fixed on his, and Scott's face suddenly flushed as the awkward moments ticked by. What's the deal here? He wondered. Does she not speak English? He was just about to pull his hand away when the woman reached out and grasped it, shaking it delicately. I'm Angela. Hey, yeah, nice to meet you, Angela. Scott grinned as the tension broke and melted away. What floor do you work on? Downstairs. Angela dropped his hand and crossed her arms under her bosom. I like to hang out up here sometimes, though. It's quiet and weird. Scott chuckled. Yeah, that's for sure. He glanced around the office as if to verify the statement. How long has it been empty like this? Angela moved, sidling over to Scott's desk and brushing her hand against the calendar blotter. Four years or so, I guess. Maybe five. She rose up on tiptoes and slid her butt onto the desktop. Once she was comfortably seated, Angela swung her feet slowly to and fro. Really? Scott eyed her with doubt. You think that long? Well, I mean, that's what this calendar says. She pinned him with her wide, dark eyes as if she were trying to see through his skull and into his brain. The little scarlet smile remained pert and amused on her lips. Yeah, but that can't be right, can it? Maybe that was an old calendar when these guys moved out. Angela shrugged her tiny shoulders, the gesture oddly bird-like. I guess maybe. I don't really know. She gazed down at the calendar and was quiet. I can't imagine that they'd let a whole floor just stay vacant for four years. They would try to lease it to somebody, wouldn't they? Scott chided himself inwardly. You sound so goddamn boring right now. Angela shrugged again without looking up from the calendar. She was gently rubbing the palm of her hand over its yellowed, wrinkled surface, caressing it. Maybe they've tried. This girl, Scott thought, much like the floor they now occupied, was a bit on the eccentric side. The way she stared and the way she smiled. There was a quiet aggression about it that made him a little nervous, but also a little excited. He wasn't sure yet that he liked her, but neither could he say that he didn't. So, what department are you in again? Instead of answering, Angela looked up at him suddenly and asked a question of her own. Have you been to the office on the other side yet? Uh, Scott faltered for a moment at the sudden change of subject. No, no I haven't. Is it cool? Is it cool? She rolled her eyes as if Scott had just asked if money was a good thing to have. It's the coolest. <laughs> she giggled and hopped up from the desk, taking Scott by the hand. Come on, you'll really like it over there. She turned and began dragging him along as if they'd known each other for two years rather than two minutes. Scott allowed Angela to pull him out the door and across the lobby to the dark corridor on the other side. He was struck again by the fact that no one had been up here to fix the lights. He couldn't believe, however, that this floor had been without occupancy for half a decade. That just didn't seem possible. They stepped through the open door of the second office. As they crossed the threshold, Angela let go of Scott's hand and took off on her own across the room. He watched her go, enjoying the way her backside moved beneath the tight fabric of her pants and then took a moment to survey the vast asteroid belt of objects that lay spread out before him. The office with the ancient files in it had a few bits of detritus left behind by Midwest import. Mostly, they were just items that attested to the fact that someone once had a business there, little more than empty desks and derelict chairs. In this second office, however, items of genuine fascination had been left behind. It was as if, on their last day, the Midwest importers had simply stood up, taken their phones, 
and exited the building, leaving everything else behind. Scott walked over to a table to his left. Stacked upon it was an iron and glass treasure trove trimmed in brass. Old nautical devices, barometers, sextants, compasses, and other things Scott couldn't identify had sat gathering dust here for God knew how long. He knew almost nothing about antiques and had no idea if these were authentic, but they certainly looked and felt old. He picked up a heavy, brass-encased compass, wiping away a layer of thick grime from around the face. Scott flipped it over and looked on the back for a label. Stamped into the casing was the name E. Ritchie, 1866, Pat. Holy shit! Scott turned the compass over and gently set it back on the table with the other Mariner's items. He walked around the table and looked for something else to examine. His heart was pounding in his chest. This is amazing. Dean had told him there was weird stuff up here. Was he kidding? Did he even know what the stuff was? Scott had trouble believing that anyone who'd been up here hadn't looted the place entirely. It was a junker's gold mine, a hoarder's wet dream. On the far wall was a low shelf, and spread across it were small knickknacks, books, wooden toys, statuettes, candelabra, and paraphernalia of all kinds. Scott strolled over to a large bookshelf near one of the windows. It was probably a highly valuable item in its own right. It was made from a dark, rich wood, mahogany, maybe, with elegant spirals carved from top to bottom on either side. There were only a few old books, still leaning drunkenly against each other here and there within the bookshelf's shadowed frame. Scott glanced at the aged spines, reading the titles that were printed in English. On the bottom shelf, shoved as far back as it would go, he discovered a small, ornate wooden box. He hunkered down and dragged it out from its resting place and into the wan light of the office. The box had a small plaque attached to its lid which was covered with words in a language that Scott wasn't familiar with. There was a lock on the front of the box, but when Scott tried the lid, it opened easily on silent hinges. Inside was a book that looked much older than all the others on the bookshelf. Its binding was a thick and weathered vellum, stained yellow-brown and blind-stamped with a strange looping design on the front and back. Scott had never held anything that felt so full of history. Something about the weight of it in his hands and the texture of its cover was unsettling. It felt dangerous, like a hoary old crocodile pretending to sleep until some foolish creature ventured close enough for it to snap its jaws around it. With wonder, he opened the book to the title page. Imposed over a depiction of many figures writhing in agony in a myriad of poses and positions, Hell, Scott assumed, was a marquee that declared the book's title as the Alphabetum Diaboli. There was more writing underneath, but time and moisture had distorted the letters, and it seemed to be in another language anyway. Scott opened to a page in the middle. It showed a diagram of several pointed stars nested within one another and covered with strange symbols and numbers. Only one word on the sheet was remotely recognizable to him. Exorcismus. He felt goosebumps rise along his arms as a chill slithered through him and he shut the ancient text. Scott? Angela's unexpected voice came from directly behind him, just like before, and startled him into dropping the book gracelessly into its box. She had once again managed to sneak up on him without a sound. He stood up quickly and faced her, smiling but red-faced. Jeez Louise, you're good at sneaking up on people, aren't you? She was standing very close to him, the buttons of her blouse a mere breath away from the ones on his shirt. She didn't answer, but just stood and looked up at him with that wide-eyed, probing stare. After a few silent seconds, Scott made a nervous sound that was something between a clearing of the throat and a long sigh. He took a step back and broke the moment by looking up and out across the office. Man, have you seen some of this stuff? 
He inwardly cringed at the adolescent flutter in his voice. Without saying a word or changing her expression, Angela stepped forward and pressed her body against Scott's, wrapping her arms around his waist, her hands coming to rest lightly on his hips. The moment he felt Angela's hands on him, Scott lost his breath. It wasn't that women made him particularly nervous, but something about her predatory stare made him feel small, young, and weak. It was a look that seemed to say, I wonder how you taste, like an owl regarding a rabbit. Did you find anything interesting? Her strange, searching eyes would not let him look away again. Scott started babbling about the book he'd found. Yeah, he said, looking down into the vacuum of her gaze. I found this crazy old book. You want to see it? Angela pushed in closer, her pelvis grinding softly against him, her little smile widening into a shark's grin. She shook her head, her curls bobbing softly against her cheeks. Nope. Want to see what I found? She licked her moist red lips slowly and salaciously. A blissful heat settled over Scott, flushing out the awkwardness. Yeah, I'd love to see what you found. His voice came out smooth and assured, much to his surprise and relief. He leaned in towards Angela, tilting his head, his mouth parting slightly as he anticipated the soft press of her lips on his. At that moment, his cell phone began to go off in his pocket, buzzing and vibrating from around his crotch. The unfortunate timing of the call shot an arrow right through the moment, deflating it. Angela cocked her head to the side, her eyebrows going up quizzically. Scott straightened up and took a step away from her, his face pinched into an expression of disappointed apology. Sorry, he reached into his pocket, dragged the squalling device out, and glanced at the screen. That's my boss. Angela watched him, saying nothing. He accepted the call and held the phone up to his ear. Hey, Dean, what's up? How's it going up there? Dean's voice had a hurried, distracted quality to it, and the reception seemed remarkably bad. Good, I guess. Scott's eyes flicked over to Angela and smiled. These file cabinets are kind of tough to navigate, though. I haven't actually been able to pull that many files. Yeah, I got you, man. They're a royal bitch to deal with. Dean made a tired sighing sound into Scott's ear. <sighs> well, it's almost five. Why don't you just bring the ones you've got on down, and tomorrow you can get started bright and early? Okay, I'll get them and be down in a few. What was that? Dean's voice was fuzzed with a snatch of interference. Didn't hear you there, Chief. Scott turned away from Angela and walked a few feet towards the office door, trying to improve his signal. Dean, you there? Yep, that's better. I said I'll be down in a few. Sounds good, partner. See you in a sec. Dean hung up before Scott could say anything else, and Scott closed his phone, shaking his head. Hey, sorry about that. That was my... He turned to where Angela had been standing and found the spot was empty. He looked around the office, his eyes skipping from pile to pile of Midwest Imports exquisite remains. She wasn't in the room anymore. Angela? Scott called out. Where'd you go? He walked into the elevator lobby, crossing the semi-lit passage into the other office. Angela? It only took a glance around to see she wasn't in there. He came back out into the hallway and looked towards the black cave of the restroom. Could she be in there? He wondered. Suddenly, a disconcerting thought occurred to him. When had Angela actually come up to the 16th floor? He realized that even if she'd been quiet enough to sneak up behind him while he was pulling files he would certainly have heard the elevator bell ding if she'd come up from another floor. She must have been hiding out in the restroom, or around the bend where the two hallways connected. He hadn't explored down there yet, since before he'd come up. Why would she do that? He couldn't really guess why, but considering her strange behavior, it didn't seem too far-fetched. 
She wouldn't even tell Scott what floor she worked on. Does she even work here? That was a disturbing idea, but Scott knew he'd seen her around the building before, though he still couldn't place exactly when or where that had been. It was with a dizzying sense of discomfiture that Scott packed up his files, grabbed his list, and left the 16th floor. He did not call out for Angela again as he stepped out into the hallway, and he did not look over his shoulder to see if she was standing silently behind him as he waited for the elevator to arrive. He stepped out into the comforting artificial light of the 13th floor and strode into his office with the files from upstairs tucked under his arm. It was almost five o'clock, and there were very few people left working. Scott passed through the aisle of mostly empty cubicles, deposited his things on his desk, and went to Dean's office, where Dean was locking his desk drawers. Hey, Scott, he said, looking up. Just getting ready to head out. There's about a half dozen beers with my name on them waiting at Wings World. Cool. Hey, I left those files over on my desk. Scott hooked his thumb back toward the corner. Did you want to look at him before I left or anything? Nah, we'll wait till the end of the day tomorrow to see what you got there, Chief. Dean stood up and clapped an amiable hand against Scott's shoulder. He walked around and said goodbye to the designer who sat across from his office, and then suddenly stopped, turning back to face Scott. Hey man, was there, uh, anybody up there? I mean, did anybody pop up there to see what you were doing? Harass you? Anything like that? Scott wondered if Dean knew about Angela. He wanted to ask, just to satisfy his curiosity about the strange woman he'd met up there, but decided against it. He didn't want it to sound like he was up there fooling around when he was supposed to be working, and he didn't want to get her in any trouble either. He had no idea if she and Dean knew each other, or if Dean might know her supervisor. It wasn't just work reasons, though, that kept Scott from mentioning her. Now that he was back down here, the whole scene up on 16 seemed to take on a dreamy haze. It felt like something that had happened to him while being intoxicated, and he couldn't quite remember the details properly. It just seemed like too much to try and explain. Nope. Scott said, shaking his head. Just a couple of sleepy flies. Dean shot Scott a thumbs up. Alrighty then, pal. See you tomorrow. He turned and walked out the door. Scott put his hands in his pockets and took a deep breath. He walked slowly over to his desk, bumping his elbow against the copy machine again, put on his jacket, and went home for the night. The next morning arrived gray and drizzling. Thunder rumbled irritably across the horizon, and the occasional flash of lightning lit up the sky to startle the slow wakers who were still waiting for their coffee to brew. Scott rolled into the lobby a few minutes before seven, shaking rain from his dripping umbrella. At that time of morning, only a few bleary-eyed stragglers were moping their way to the elevators or waiting in line at the commissary. There was also Ray, the security guard, standing with his hands in his pockets in front of his desk, his guard's hat cocked back on his head. Scott had not slept well the night before. He remembered slipping through a jostling tumble of vague and uncomfortable dreams, tossing and turning and sweating his way towards dawn. He'd woken up with a headache thudding at the back of his skull, and his first thought, after, Ugh, my head hurts was of the girl he'd met the day before. He was determined to find out who she was and where she worked. He wanted to ask about her bizarre behavior from the day before. He also just wanted to see her again. Something about her made him want to get close to her. Scott nodded to Ray as he walked past and received a good morning in return. He'd nearly turned the corner to the elevators when it occurred to him that Ray saw everyone who passed through this lobby day in and day out. Surely he'd seen Angela before. He probably knew her well. Scott turned around, nearly running into a somnolent woman in a long, wet coat. Jesus, fuck! Had been her half-hearted response as she dodged around him and hurried over to the security desk. Help you with something, Scotty? Ray asked curiously. Hey, Ray. Yeah, maybe. 
Scott fidgeted a moment, trying to think of the best way to ask about Angela. I've got kind of a weird question. Well, I can't say I'm surprised. Everybody who goes up there has some kind of question about it. Scott blinked, nonplussed. What? Ray blinked back at Scott awkwardly. Wait, what are you asking about? I was going to ask you about a girl that works here. What did you think I was asking about? Ray's eyes did a strange little back-and-forth dance in his wrinkled face. Oh, hell, I don't know. It's early. I think I'm still half asleep. Ray fiddled nervously with his hat. You go ahead and ask what you wanted to. Scott felt a low weariness drain through him. He suddenly wasn't sure he still wanted to know anything about the dark-eyed girl who'd grabbed his hand so confidently the day before. He thought it might just be better for him to go upstairs, get his project over with, and get on with his life. He'd already pestered Ray, though, and decided to go ahead and ask. Uh, it's no big deal. I just wanted to ask about this girl I met yesterday. Angela? She works here in the building somewhere. Ray seemed to recover himself. Oh, sure. Was it Angela Duncan or Angela Havercast? See, that's just it. I don't know. We met and just kind of hit it off while I was pulling files, but I never got her last name or which department she was in. What does she look like? Well, Scott ran his hand over his wet head. She's cute, short and skinny, curly brown hair. Ray considered for a moment. Well, that sounds like Angela Duncan, I guess. Got yourself a new work, buddy? Scott shrugged. I don't know. We were just kind of goofing around up on 16. I was getting the feeling that... He was going to tell Ray that he was getting the feeling that she kind of liked him, and then realized how childish that would sound, at least to his ears. Ah, uh, never mind. It's no big deal. I was just curious. Ray favored Scott with an odd expression. You say you guys were messing around up on 16? Well, not really messing around so much as just looking at all the crap that's up there. You ever check that stuff out? Ray leaned against the security desk, wincing. Ugh, these rainy days are hell on my knees. He straightened up and regarded Scott solemnly. Yeah, I've been up there plenty of times. Not for a while, though. There's a lot of crazy shit up there. Ray nodded. I know. Listen... Did she go up there with you yesterday? Scott shook his head. Nah, she just sort of showed up while I was getting files. To be honest, it was kind of weird. I didn't hear her at all till she said my name. Didn't hear the elevator go off or anything. It was like she just appeared out of nowhere. Hmm, hmm. Ray looked up at the ceiling. Well, listen, Scotty. Better that you don't go poking around too much up there. A lot of that stuff is old. It's been up there a long time. Better to just not go up there at all. Well, I can't not go up there today. I have to keep getting these stupid files. Suddenly, he remembered he had another question for the old security guard. Oh, yeah. And is it true that nobody's had a business up there for almost five years? Ray didn't say anything for a few moments. He and Scott just looked at one another, letting the space between them thicken. Finally, Ray spoke. It's been a long time. I don't remember how long. Just be careful up there around all that old junk, Scotty. Scott rolled his eyes. Why do people keep saying that? Is it haunted or something? He suddenly realized that he was talking loudly. He lowered his voice. I mean, I could just about believe it. Ray stepped behind the security desk and sat down on his chair. He looked down into the little closed-circuit video monitor that showed him views from various cameras around the building. You ought to get up to work, Scotty. You're going to be late. Scott looked up at the wall clock above the commissary door. Damn it, I'm already late. He turned and headed towards the elevators. Later, Ray. Ray waved to Scott's departing back and went on looking at the security monitor. Scott stopped on 13 long enough to stow his jacket and umbrella at his desk. He grabbed a donut from a box that someone had left in the break room and then headed straight upstairs. 
Heavy, ashen clouds clung to the sky outside, and the 16th floor was even darker and more dismal than it had been the day before. The rain slopping against the building sounded like low, chattering voices, and Scott kept turning to glance behind him as he worked, trying not to be caught unawares again by Angela, or anyone else. All morning long, he roved back and forth from the filing cabinets in the abandoned office to the small desk where he set the files he pulled. Names and numbers slid across his mind like lines of marching ants. Williamson, Axel T., File 1201, LME Financial Services Incorporated, File 240A, 240B, Southern Ohio Builders, File 766, Lance, Frederick, and Frederick Wealth Management, File 418. It all became a litany of meaningless gibberish in Scott's mind. If anything or anyone watched him from anywhere in the office, he didn't notice it. Scott had found a groove and lost himself in his task. By the end of the morning, he had pulled more than half of his list. Another couple of hours and he'd be completely finished. At noon, Scott decided to stop for lunch. He thought a sub-sandwich from the commissary sounded delicious, so he left his files and the dank office behind and took the elevator downstairs. The doors opened onto the first floor, and he stepped out, thinking that a little carton of chocolate milk might be nice too. He planned to take his lunch and eat outside under the overhang and watch the rain come down. Despite how unsettling the day had started, Scott thought it was beginning to go rather well. As he was passing through the lobby, Scott noticed a small, feminine figure standing at the security desk chatting with Ray. She was wearing a cream-colored cardigan and a brown skirt today, but there was no mistaking those springy curls. He veered over towards the security desk and slipped up next to the woman, leaning in close. She looked up and regarded him curiously. Ray stood back and watched, his eyes flat, his mouth tense. Hey, what's up? Scott smiled broadly down at the woman. What happened to you yesterday? The woman's dark eyes reflected confusion and nothing more. I'm sorry? She took a step back, putting some space between herself and Scott. You know, you disappeared after my boss called. He noticed she wasn't wearing the distinctive red lipstick she'd had on. What? The woman pulled her cardigan close around her. Compared to the bird-like grace she displayed the day before, her movements were jerky and awkward. I'm sorry, you're thinking of someone else. A harsh, nervous little laugh fell out of her mouth in a breathy rush. We've never met. His smile faltered. What kind of game was she playing? Somehow, Scott wasn't entirely surprised. She had been a whirlwind of crazy behavior the day before sneaking around, spying on him, staring at him, grabbing onto him. She likes to freak people out, make them uncomfortable. It's how she gets off. So, you don't remember me at all? You don't remember meeting me yesterday up on the 16th floor? Hanging around with me? Nothing? The woman goggled at him, unbelieving. What are you talking about? She sounded outraged. I'm sorry, but... You've obviously got me confused with somebody else, guy. I told you, I've never seen you before in my life. Scott nodded and let a sarcastic smile spread across his face. Okay, you're right. I must be crazy. We've never met, Angela. You didn't sneak up behind me twice yesterday up on 16, and you didn't... Well, you know what else you didn't do... Her mouth dropped open and her eyes flicked from Scott to Ray. She looked genuinely scared. Ray, who is this guy? She took another step back. How does he know my name? It's okay, hon, Ray said as he came around the desk and gestured reassuringly at Scott. Scotty's new here. He don't know a lot of people. I just got you mixed up with somebody else. Angela Havercast, probably. But she's fat. Angela protested. Her voice held none of the sultry lilt that it had the previous afternoon. Scott looked at Angela while Ray tried to allay her fear. 
she really did seem to not know who he was or what he was talking about. There was no mischievous glint at the corner of her eye and no hint that she was putting on some kind of an act. Her disavowal was very convincing. Does she really not remember me? He suddenly felt his anger at Angela's supposed mind game disappear, replaced by a deep, chilling embarrassment. A mortified knot grew in his gut, twisting and bulging. His gaze dropped to the floor. I'm sorry. Scott's voice was very quiet, very low. You reminded me of someone I met up on 16 yesterday. See? Ray's mouth stretched into a strained smile. It was just a misunderstanding. Angela stepped away from Ray's security desk and fixed Scott with a suspicious glare. I've never been to the 16th floor. I didn't even know there was a 16th floor here. She gave Scott one last disapproving look and then turned and walked away. Before she was out of his earshot, Scott was able to catch only one word amongst her angry muttering. Psycho. Scott stood rooted in front of the security desk, stunned and embarrassed. He watched Angela walk away and felt doubt, like a physical ache, roiling through his body. He knew, absolutely knew, that he hadn't been mistaken about her identity. The woman who just rebuked him there on the first floor lobby was the same woman who'd flirted with him, in the strangest way possible, the day before in the deserted offices upstairs. In another way, however, she was not at all the same woman. The 16th floor version of Angela had been confident and lithe, her movements deliberate and poised and silent as starshine, her voice a dark velvet purr. First floor Angela, by contrast, struck Scott as being nervous and angry. To be fair, he chided himself, this impression of her is based solely on how she reacts when a strange man walks up to her and accuses her of trying to bang him in an abandoned office. He acknowledged this point in his mind, but the concession didn't change the fact that this person seemed to be just another harried worker flitting through the building like a distracted ghost. Ray walked over to Scott and touched his arm. You okay, Scotty? Scott looked at Ray with naked confusion. He wiped the tips of his fingers across his dry lips and shrugged loosely. I don't know, man. He gestured to where Angela had just been standing. I swear I met that chick yesterday. I really did, but she was completely different from that lady. Same lady, but different lady. He uttered a crazy little laugh. <laughs> Sorry, I know I sound like a nut. Ray patted Scott lightly on the back. No need to be sorry, I believe you. Well, I believe you met someone anyway. Someone that looked just like her. Scott shook his head. She told me her name. Told me her name was Angela. I know. Ray favored him with solemn eyes. Listen, since you're working up there, I should tell you a few things about that office, but I can't do it right now. I can sneak away for a few in... Ray glanced at his wristwatch. About 25 minutes. What do you mean? What kinds of things? Ray shook his head. Not out here. We'll go sit outside where we can smoke. Ray circled back around behind the security desk and sat down, checking the monitor. You probably won't believe what I have to tell you, but considering the couple of days you've had, you might after all. Scott felt a gauzy film of unreality drift down upon him. All right. He looked around the lobby as if he'd just woken to discover himself in an unexpected place. I have to go back up there and get my files. I'll drop them off in my office and then I'll come back down here. Uh... Ray's bushy gray eyebrows drew together with disapproval. That's not a great idea. He pointed to the line of people standing outside the commissary, waiting to place an order. Why don't you go over and get yourself something to eat? They've got clam chowder in the deli today. And go wait for me out of the tables. I have to get those files to Dean. I'd really like to have this shit done by the end of the day today. I don't really want to be up there any more than I have to. I know, Scotty, but trust me. Dean would understand. It's okay. 
Scott seemed to have come back to himself somewhat. It'll only take a few minutes. Then you can tell me whatever it is you want to tell me. Scott wrapped his knuckles on the security desk and then, without another word, turned and hurried back to the elevators. Ray watched him go, and when Scott turned the corner, he looked down at the three security screens, glancing up from time to time to utter a greeting or a reply to the rain-soaked figures who walked past. The elevator doors opened onto the familiar dusk of the 16th floor lobby, and Scott stepped out as a roll of thunder rattled the windows and walls. He had intended to do exactly what he'd told Ray, which was to go in, grab the files he'd gathered, and head back down to 13. Now that he was up there, however, a strange impulse drove him to the opposite side, back into the treasure den left behind by Midwest imports and artifacts. He had an urge to take a very quick look at some of the items he hadn't had a chance to peruse the day before. The stormlight from outside the windows painted the sweet and blue-gray shadows, and Scott felt like he was walking into an aquarium. He let his gaze meander across the silent and dusty huddles of objects that waited around the room. He passed the table with the old nautical items on it and walked over to a shelf along the back wall. This was where he'd noticed all of the jumbled knickknacks the day before. There were a number of dead things mounted on white backing and framed behind glass. Butterflies, rhinoceros beetles, a huge millipede curled up in a spiral. Several large scorpions, a tarantula that was bigger than Scott's open hand, and an emaciated, mummified bat. There was a stack of small rugs next to a glass case that held a delicate-looking pair of spectacles. Further down the shelf, past some mismatched marble chess pieces, Scott found a collection of jewelry. Elaborate beaded bracelets and gauzy necklaces all lay tangled together like a nest of shiny, chunky snakes next to a silver display case full of rings sheathed in red velvet. None of the jewelry held much interest for Scott, and he was about to walk away when his eyes happened upon a small, oval brooch. It was made of opal inlaid with ivory. The ivory was carved very intricately into the shape of a tiny carousel horse. It was a lovely little piece, strung on a simple silver chain. Scott picked it up and looked at it closely. The carousel horse was incredibly detailed with minuscule ribbons threaded through its mane and tail and wound in a coil down its carven pole. He thought his mother would love it. She had a decent collection of carousel items, snow globes, collector's plates, things like that, but no carousel jewelry. Scott imagined her face lighting up as he handed it to her. He imagined her surprised gasp and her grateful smile. There was no way he could leave this piece here, knowing how happy it would make her, so he slipped the brooch into his pants pocket. Nobody's gonna miss this. He took one last look around the office, still amazed at the fact that all of this stuff was just sitting around up here undisturbed, and then turned and walked out into the elevator lobby. He crossed to the other side and was about to step through the doorless doorway to get a stack of files when he heard a sound from halfway down the hall. He jerked to a stop and turned around, his pulse thumping in his ears. He wasn't sure because the sounds of the rain, the muttering thunder, and his own footsteps had melted together into a clustered, distracting wash, but Scott thought it had sounded like a word. In fact, it sounded to Scott like it might have been his name. He stood motionless, trying to filter out the background noises and straining to catch any other sound that might explain what he thought he'd heard. A moment later, it happened again, and this time there was no doubt about it. A fuzzy, echoing voice called out. Scott. Scott. The hair on his arms and neck stood up, and a chill slid down his spine like a drop of ice water. The call had come from the inky depths of the restroom. He waited to see if it would come again. Scott, I'm in the bathroom. Come find me. Oh, Jesus. Scott took a breath. Angela? He hadn't meant to call back. 
He had, in fact, meant to turn around and quickly walk to the elevators. This seemed like the perfect time to get downstairs and meet with Ray to hear whatever it was he wanted to talk about. Although now, Scott thought he had a pretty good guess what that might be. Instead of moving out of the corridor, his feet actually carried him forward a step towards the restroom. Angela, is that you? Scotty. The distorted voice was low and jagged. It bounced merrily around the tiled bathroom walls, sounding horribly present and horribly real. Whoever it was, it was definitely not Angela. Duncan or Havercast, Scott was very sure of that. His eyes widened and his heart began to pound in his chest. He started backing away towards the elevator, getting ready to turn and run, when he caught another sound from within the lightless restroom. A deliberate, echoing shuffle. He realized with terror that it was the sound of feet scraping slowly, but not too slowly, not slowly enough, across the tile floor towards the entrance, towards him. Whether it was someone playing a prank on him or whether it was something else entirely, Scott had finally had enough. With arms and legs flailing, he fled into the lobby. He slid to a stop in front of the elevators and began slamming his open palm repeatedly against the button. There was a clap of thunder, and suddenly the already weak lights of the 16th floor flickered. Come on! Shit, come on! Scott resisted the urge to turn and look behind him. He pressed himself against the wall and continued to pound the elevator button. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on! The bell dinged as the elevator arrived, to Scott's enormous relief. And that's when he heard the voice call from just behind him in the lobby. Scotty, it's me. There was a tone of oily glee in that cracked voice. It was a voice that reminded him of black water, sluicing through gutters choked with decaying leaves and clumps of garbage. He didn't want to turn around and see. The doors to the elevator were opening. He could jump on and wait for them to close behind him without facing whoever or whatever it was that was calling his name in that low, craggy voice. He didn't want to, but he did anyway. Scott spun around with a panicky jerk and looked. He let loose a sharp, hoarse cry of horror when he saw who it was. He knew that it couldn't be her, but there she was, grinning at him viciously through violently red lips, holding her arms out to embrace him. It was his grandmother, whose funeral was the only one he had ever attended. Scotty. His name dripped from her dead mouth. It looked like she'd pressed her lips into the open guts of a fresh roadkill. Lipstick was smeared all over her cheeks and chin. She looked up and out at him from beneath her brows like a coyote as she shambled forward. A string of saliva hung from her lower lip. She was wearing a blouse that Scott remembered well from his childhood, a polyester nightmare from the 70s covered with large blocks of vibrant colors. She had worn it all the time, and when she was alive, Scott had found it whimsical. Now that she was ten years in her grave, or rather out of it at the moment, it looked more like Grammy was wrapped in a cocoon of vomit. Grammy, please. Scott began to cry, his back to the wall now as he tried to shrink into himself. He didn't notice that the elevator doors had closed and that it was on its way back down. Grammy, please don't. Tears spilled from the corners of his eyes as he shook his head back and forth, trying to disbelieve this apparition into nothingness. Instead of going away, Scott's dead grandmother lurched ever closer. She seemed very solid, not at all how he would imagine a ghost to be. She cast a shadow on the floor that undulated in the watery light from the windows. He could hear her tiny, grunting breaths as she scuttled towards him. She didn't move very fast, but she was only a few feet away now. 
Her eyes were horribly bright and shone with hideous delight. Her long, bony fingers grasped and twitched like spider's legs as she reached out to take him into her arms. Her feet shushed across the smooth tiles, the black orthopedic shoes she'd always worn scraping and clacking. Her tongue wormed out from between her square yellow teeth and licked across her lips, leaving a ropey scum of spit. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of lightning. A moment later, an ear-shattering crash of thunder rattled the building, and the lights went completely out. Scott was plunged into an almost total darkness. He sank to the floor, weeping. In his worst, deepest, unremembered dreams, he had never come across a vision so repulsive, and now he was alone in the dark with it. He wasn't sure if it was worse to have to face its bright, greedy eyes and its drooling red mouth, or if it was worse not to see it but wonder where it might be. Pitched into blackness, he realized the sound of it scuttling through the echoing gloom of the foyer was worse than either one. He covered his face with his hands and screamed, waiting for the moment when she would hug him, just as she had when he was a boy. Would she be cold? Would she smell? Scott continued to shake his head in negation, unable to conceive of what would happen once she reached him. Through his fingers, he could just make out her bobbing shadow as she crept forward. She was almost upon him when the elevator bell dinged and the doors opened. Ray sprung out into the lobby with a lit flashlight in his hand. He swung it around and the light strobed across the shape of Scott's revenant grandmother like a noxious kaleidoscope. She had been crouched down right in front of Scott's face, reaching her long, branch-like arms around him. When the light struck her, she looked up in shock. Ray waved the flashlight, shouting, Back! Get back, you old bitch! The storm continued outside, the rain pounding hard against the windows. Thunder rumbled like a giant's footsteps, and Scott's paralysis shattered. He sprung to his feet on shaky legs. What's going on? He screamed at Ray as the security guard brandished his light like a gun at the hissing thing before them. What is it, Ray? Ray waved his free hand fiercely towards the elevator. Hurry up! Push the button! She ain't gonna sit still for long! The grandmother thing was crouching there in the yellow beam of light like a huge, pale scorpion. Its mouth was still stretched into a hungry sneer, but its eyes were filled with murky confusion. It looked from Ray to Scott and back again, seemingly unsure as to whom it should approach. Scott, heeding Ray's instruction, pressed the elevator button and waited. Ray was shining the beam of the flashlight on the apparition, which seemed to have lost some of its boldness. It stood before them, no longer grinning, its arms lowered. It scowled at them, looking like a spoiled child being denied candy. It was slowly starting to lose its resemblance to Scott's grandmother. Its skin had begun to yellow, and the arrangement of its face began to change. The features were spreading and widening, and the corners of its mouth now stretched nearly to its ears. Its eyes had grown into large, unblinking circles, and while Scott couldn't see it happening in real time, it seemed to him that the thing's nose was thinning and elongating. The elevator bell dinged behind the two men, startling them, and the doors slid apart. Scott dashed behind Ray into the chamber, having never been so happy to see the bank of buttons that marked the floors below. He put his hand out to hold the doors open for Ray, who stepped quickly back from the lobby floor and over the threshold. Scott wondered if the thing would try to charge in as they waited for the doors to close. He pressed the button for the first floor and took a deep breath. He removed his hand from the opening, and the doors began to shut. The thing in the lobby did not try to advance on them, but simply stood there, watching as they fled. Illuminated by the narrowing light of the elevator's interior, it no longer really resembled a human being at all. 
The elevator doors clicked shut in front of Scott and Ray's faces, and the sight of it, standing alone and disappointed on the 16th floor, was cut off. The elevator began to descend, taking them back to the world of sanity and light. Neither man spoke on the trip down, and Scott leaned against the wall, breathing deeply, wiping tears from his face. They were in Ray's tiny office. It was little more than a large closet that had a metal desk and a three-drawer file cabinet with a very old television sitting on top of it. There was also a coat rack and a couple of mismatched swivel chairs, and that was all there was room for. There was no smoking permitted inside the building, but both Scott and Ray were puffing on cigarettes anyway. Smoke filled the little box of a room and floated lazily towards the ceiling fan that spun above them. They sat that way for some time. Finally, Ray broke the silence. So, I guess you figured out the 16th floor is not a great place to be. Ray dropped the butt of his cigarette into a styrofoam cup that still held a couple sips worth of coffee in it. There was a hissing sound as the stub hit the cold liquid. Scott nodded his head slowly, looking down at the floor between his feet. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. He took a long drag on his cigarette, looked up at Ray, and exhaled. So, could you tell me a little bit more about that, please? Ray sat back in his chair and gazed up into the gently spinning blades of the ceiling fan, crossing his arms. He sat that way for a moment, taking time to consider how to begin, and then he looked back over at Scott. Well... He frowned and cleared his throat. Look. Scott flashed a rueful grin. I'm obviously going to believe whatever it is you say. After what we saw up there, I'll believe anything anybody ever tells me for the rest of my life. Okay, Ray began. The thing is, I don't have any for sure facts... I just know what I've seen and what other people have told me they've seen. Ray lit another cigarette, his third since they'd gotten to his office. He took a puff on it and went on. I guess it started when that company up there, Midwest Importers, left. Well, for all I know, it started even before they left. Maybe that's what made them leave. Who knows? Anyhow, one day they just sort of up and moved out. Had to be five years ago or more... I know I've been here going on ten myself, and I'd been here a while when it happened. Can't remember if I'd gotten my five-year set of wine glasses yet, but it was damn close to that. Four years. That's what the calendar up there said. Scott tried to rub the chill from his arms. Now I guess I know why nobody ever moved back in. Ray nodded. Only four. It seems longer than that, but time starts to get fuzzy at my age. He shook his head with a contemplative sigh and went on. But yeah, I think that's exactly why nobody else ever took over those offices. Oh, people would come and look the place over. Your company thought about taking over that floor not long after they vacated. That was probably the worst it ever was before today. Your boss, Dean, had himself a nasty scare up there. Scott gaped with surprise. Dean? Are you serious? Yep. He's one of the ones that helped put those big old file cabinets up there in the first place. He's the reason there's no door on that office. Shit, I knew he was being weird. Scott shook his head. Why would he send me up there if he knew? What happened to him? Well, Scotty, they still got a business to run, you know. Can't stop making money on account of your building is haunted. If it makes you feel any better, he probably didn't like making you go up there. He seems like a nice enough kid. Ray blew smoke out from the corner of his mouth, so it didn't go into Scott's face. Back when he first started, they got him and another guy, Pete, Tommy, I can't remember, to heft those file cabinets up to the 16th floor. It was a Saturday. They didn't want him disturbing the office during the work week. The import people had been gone about a year or so, I guess, and nobody really done anything with it yet. The custodians had started to talk amongst themselves. I hadn't seen anything, yet, but I heard somebody say that they wouldn't go in the bathroom up there anymore because they saw a ghost in there. 
I laughed about it then. Ray picked up the cup they'd been using as an ashtray, swirling the contents, and went on. Well, so Dean and this other guy start lugging those cabinets up there on dollies. There's a freight elevator in the back up there around the corner from the offices. They rode up and down for a good couple of hours, getting those big-ass things set up. Round about that time, so far as I know, the guy helping Dean went out to use the bathroom and left Dean in the office by himself. When he came back out, the door to the office was shut tight, and Dean was on the other side screaming his fucking head off. That guy, Pete or Tommy or whoever, tries and tries to open the door, but it won't budge. Meanwhile, he hears Dean in there screaming at somebody, and he hears somebody else's voice in there with him screaming back, laughing. Pete or Tommy didn't have a cell phone, so he ran down the stairs to 13 and called down to the security desk. He was damn lucky I was there. I don't always work weekends, and when I don't, there ain't nobody down here at the desk. Scott wasn't sure what he was feeling about this whole experience, but he suddenly felt bad for thinking such ungenerous thoughts about Dean. Jesus Christ, what happened to him? Ray set the cup back down and shrugged. Well, I picked up the phone and that guy told me somebody's locked in the office with Dean up on 16 and that they're fighting or something. I told him I'd meet him up there and I grabbed my keys and my flashlight, which is the only goddamn weapon I'm allowed to carry, and I hurried on up the elevator. I was some concerned because I knew that nobody else should have been up there. On weekends, everybody that comes in the building has to sign in at my desk, and there were only four or five other people besides Dean and what's-his-face working. I doubted very much it was any of those folks and wondered who the hell could be up there causing trouble. He paused a moment to take a breath before continuing. When I stepped off the elevator, what's his name? Wait, Dave. Shit, I remember now his name was Dave. Well, he was pounding on that office door hollering, and I can hear Dean on the other side just pounding back, screaming and crying, and I could hear that other voice too laughing like I don't know what. It shook me up some bad. Whoever the guy was in there with Dean sounded big. Well, we pulled at that knob and yanked and pried and couldn't open that door for shit. I mean, the knob turned in our hands, it wasn't locked, but the door just wouldn't come open. I realized we were going to have to take the door off, so I tell Dave to wait there and keep trying the door, and I headed back down here to grab my toolbox. I got back upstairs and now Dean's just whimpering like a beat puppy on the other side of that door, and the voice on the other side has changed. Now it was a high-pitched voice, like a woman's or a little kid's, and it was singing to him, loud. Oh god, but it was an awful sound. Made my balls crawl up into my belly like a turtle into his shell. How many fucking people are in there with him? I asked Dave and he said he didn't know. He said the singing started just a couple minutes after I left to get my tools. Ray's cigarette had burned down to the filter, mostly unsmoked between his fingers as he told his story. He dropped it absently into the cup and sighed. Well, I got out my electric screwdriver and started undoing the door hinges. It took a few minutes and I was sweating, wondering what we were going to find when we got in there. The door started leaning as I got each hinge off, and finally the last one popped off. The door falls out into our hands, and me and Dave tossed it aside and busted in there like swat. Dean was crumpled up against the wall next to the door, just sobbing and hitching. His eyes were screwed shut tight, and his arms were up over his head. All the singing and shouting had stopped, but both of us, I swear this is true, we both heard this giggling coming from the other office across the lobby. I told Dave to get Dean out of there and get him downstairs so I could go over to see what was what. I was some um, younger then and braver. I was ready to bust some ass. He chuckled softly, his eyes looking haunted. So I got over into that other office. You've been in there, so you know how crazy it is. All that shit laying around everywhere. Plenty of things for at least one person to hide behind, but not really anywhere for a big fella to go. The laughing had stopped by this point, 
Dave and Dean had gone on downstairs, and it was dead quiet. All I had was my flashlight, and all of a sudden, I got a real bad feeling. I called out, Whoever's in here better come out right fucking now. I tried to sound real hard, but I was nervous as hell. Then, I heard a voice from right behind me say my name. I turned around, and that was the first and the worst time I ever saw something up there. Scott had been waiting for this with dread and fascination. Holy shit, what was it? Ray was quiet for several long seconds, just breathing loudly through his nose. Finally, he spoke. It was my wife, naked, covered in blood and holding this big old hatchet down at her side. There was more blood and other gooey shit dripping off the head of it. She just smiled up at me and licked her lips. I'll never forget that look on her face, like she had just baked a pie and wanted me to try it and tell her how good it was. Damn, Ray. Scott's eyes flicked to Ray's desk. There was a graduation picture of a young woman Scott assumed was Ray's daughter or niece, or even granddaughter, but it was the only one he had. Is she... I mean, was she... What, dead? Ray shook his head. Nah, she's alive. Alive and kicking. Hopefully she's making me chilly tonight. I feel like I could eat a whole pot of it right now. He stopped and had a coughing fit into his fist for a moment, a dry, rattling sound deep in his chest. When it passed, he went on. I knew right away that wasn't really her. There was no way in hell she was standing there in that office with her tits hanging out covered in blood, and God knows where she would have gotten an axe from. I screamed like a little girl and took off running. I turned to see if she was following me, but there was nobody there. I was all by myself. I took the elevator down to check on Dave and Dean. Dave quit not long after, but somehow Dean managed to stick it out but I guarantee he's never gone back up there again. In fact, I've only been back up there a handful of times since then. I hate it up there. He started to pull yet another smoke from his pack and then decided against it, putting the pack back on the desk. Well, he never could get Dean to tell us what it was he saw. He got calmed down some and said he didn't want to talk about it. We told him we'd believe whatever he said. I didn't tell him then about what I'd seen. I have since, but at that moment I was too shook up to think about it, much less talk about it. I did tell him, though, that we heard other voices in there with him and knew something had been in there. He wouldn't budge, though. Never has, either. He went so far as to say he saw some folks that couldn't have been there, but he wouldn't say who or what they were doing to him. All he'd say is that they showed him things. Awful things. After a while, we just let it go and decided not to talk about it no more. The files got put up there, so nobody needed to tell anybody else anything. One of the custodians found the door and called me about it a few days later. I told him we'd taken it off and forgotten to move it. He went and put it in a storage closet, and so far as I know, it's still in there somewhere. He never did ask why we took it off. Scott was astounded. Wow, Dean. He leaned back in the rickety chair and ran his hands through his hair. How does he still work here after that? Ray shrugged. Eh, you get past it, Scotty. Sometimes you can't let something like this chase you off of a good job. I bet Dean's making good money up there. He's got that nice little car and he's always traveling around. He does well for himself. Worked his way up. If he'd left over that, who knows where he might have ended up. You'll see for yourself. Ray grabbed a half-finished bottle of water from the desk and took a swig from it. I mean, hell, I've seen shit off and on for years ever since that day. After that, it's mostly been on the security monitor, but it's still kind of upsetting. Speaking of which, that's how I knew you were in trouble. After you had your little moment with Miss Angela, sorry you had to go through that, by the way, that was tough to watch. I figured I should keep an eye on you, and there's a few cameras on every floor. I was watching you on the one above the elevators up there. As soon as I saw you start running for the lobby, I knew I needed to get my ass upstairs. 
Let me tell you, son, your incident might not have lasted as long as Dean's, but it was every bit as bad. I hate to ask, but who was the, you know, who was it pretending to be? Scott looked down at his feet again and answered in a meek whisper. It was my gram, my grandmother. She's been dead a long time. Ray sucked air through his teeth with a hiss. Yikes, that's bad, Scott. I'm sorry. He looked down at the floor, not wanting to see Scott's wounded expression any longer. Anyhow, the custodians kept getting spooked. I watched it happen sometimes. I'd see him up there working, and suddenly they'd jump and spin around like something was behind him. I got no sound on the monitors, so I never know what they're hearing, but it sure keeps them from going up there. They've actually gone through two cleanup companies since this shit started. Sent in a nice crew of Spanish ladies. I felt real bad for them, but what could I say? You can't really tell people about that so much. The first agency had a few people up and quit before they terminated their contract. After that, they went back to hiring their own people. I don't know if the building owners tell them they don't have to go up on 16, or if they just look the other way, but they've had the same couple of guys now for a few years. They don't really go up there too much unless a pipe bursts or something. That's happened before, and I was asked to accompany them while they fixed it. Didn't see nothing at all those times. Nobody has much reason to go up there anymore, so I don't know how it's gotten around so much, but everybody kind of knows that there's something wrong with that floor. I know a few people have gone poking around up there. Maybe a few just went up out of curiosity or because of the stories they'd heard. However it happens, word's gotten around, and now the whole building has a reputation. People say they've heard and seen stuff all over the place, but I've never had anything happen anywhere but up there. I check every floor a couple times a day, except for 16. Sometimes I start feeling guilty about not doing my job completely, and so I sort of poke my head in each office up there. A couple of times I've heard my name. Once, I looked in the hallway and saw a young woman I didn't recognize just standing there by the bathroom, looking at me, smiling. She didn't say nothing, and so I just backed away and pretended I didn't see her. If I came across an actual person up there, I'd never even know it. I always just assume it's that whatever it is. What is it, do you think? Scott asked. A ghost or something? Ray sat and thought for a minute. He shook his head. No, I guess if you consider a ghost a person who's died and is just hanging around, then I don't think it's a ghost. I don't know if there even is a name for whatever that thing is, but I don't believe in my heart that it was ever a human person. I do believe that it is very, very bad. Has it ever physically hurt anybody? Scott leaned forward. He was thinking about what might have happened if Ray hadn't shown up before the thing had been able to get him in its grasp. He couldn't imagine the outcome, but the idea gave him a shudder. No, so far as I know, it's never actually hurt anybody in a literal sense, but I'm not sure that it couldn't hurt somebody. I don't know what might have happened to you if I hadn't gotten up there in time. They both sat back in their chairs, not speaking for a while. Scott was thinking that, while Dean and Ray might have been able to get past their experiences on the 16th floor, he wasn't sure that he would be able to keep working in that building. Ray looked at him from beneath his wily brows and seemed to read his mind. Listen, Scott, if you need to figure out what you want to do, that's perfectly understandable. Your reality took a real hard kick to the behind today, and you probably need to sort of digest that. Ray picked up the nearly empty water bottle and drained it. I can go up and talk to Dean about it for you. Believe me, he's going to understand. He'll understand better than anybody else ever could. Whatever you decide to do, he's going to be okay with it. Scott looked at Ray for a moment and then stood and stretched. He walked over and patted the older man on the arm gratefully. Thanks, Ray. I really appreciate that. I think I'm probably going to go home for the day. I honestly don't think I can face going upstairs right now, even just to get my jacket. Sure, Scotty, sure. Ray stood up and opened the door to his office. A cloud of smoke billowed out into the corridor and faded away into the air above them. 
Both men stepped out and headed into the lobby, stopping at the security desk. Don't worry about your jacket. It'll be fine till you decide what you want to do. Ray's voice and the look in his eyes told Scott that Ray understood he probably wouldn't be coming back. The two men faced each other there on the first floor of the building. The rain still fell from a battered sky and the thunder continued to grumble and grouse. There were still people coming and going, walking into the commissary and passing by the security desk on their way to the elevators, swinging purses and briefcases and umbrellas. The two men did not notice any of them as they regarded each other from opposite sides of the desk. The older man smiled at the younger man, and the two shook hands. They exchanged farewells, and the younger man turned and walked away from the security desk, turning once to wave one final time. After that, Scott didn't look back. He walked out into the wet, gray afternoon and never returned again. Scott entered the house he shared with his parents and called out to see if anyone was home. His mother was in the family room watching a movie on TV. She asked why he was home so early. Was everything okay? He said he wasn't sure and then went to his room. He sat on his bed leaning forward with his face in his hands for a very long time. After a while, his mother came and knocked on his door. Scotty, you okay? Scott sat up and looked at the door. Yeah, Mom, I'm fine. Just tired. Think I'm gonna take a nap. Okay. Scott's mother sounded unconvinced, but she didn't try to draw him out any further. He did, indeed, plan on taking a nap, and he sincerely hoped that his mind took pity on him and kept the nightmares at bay. He reached into his pants pocket to remove his keys and wallet, and pulled out the small opal brooch that he'd taken from the 16th floor. He held it, cupped in his palm, and appraised its lovely details. He ran his thumb over the raised edges of the little carousel horse at its center. His mother was going to love it. He hoped that giving it to her in the morning might help to offset the news that he'd quit his job. He laid the brooch on the table beside his bed, a pretty souvenir of a very bad day. He undid his pants, stripped them off, and lay down on top of his covers. He was asleep in minutes. Sometime later in the night, long after darkness had fallen, Scott awoke to the sensation of someone climbing into his bed with him. His eyes snapped wide open, and he saw a dark, hunched shape rising above him. He felt it pressing down against the bed, and then his body as it clambered up onto his belly. It didn't feel like arms and legs against him, more like a cold jelly slipping around him, sticky and slick. The thing made clicking and clacking sounds as it squirmed up towards his face. He opened his mouth to scream, but even as he sucked in a gasp of air, he felt something long and wet slide between his lips, twining around his tongue like a lover's kiss. It filled his mouth with an unspeakable taste and then withdrew from him. As he lay frozen in an ecstasy of terror, he heard a sound coming from it. It was a low, chittering buzz that sounded like laughter. It spoke his name in a voice that was not remotely human, but was, somehow, very familiar. You've been listening to The Sixteenth Floor by R.K. Combrink. R.K. Combrink is a writer and artist who lives in Cincinnati, Ohio, with his wife and two sons. He is a founding cast member of the popular horror podcast, Night of the Living Podcast. He enjoys iced tea, unsweet, and genuinely believes in Sasquatch. You can find more of his work through his publisher, Velux Books, www.veloxbooks.com. Well, my friends, that concludes things for tonight's episode. I'd like to thank R.K. Combrink for his story and Danielle Hewitt for her wonderful voice work. 
Next week, we're going to start a two-parter featuring a new story in a series that some of you might be familiar with. Until then, friends, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's dark tales, Paul J. McSorley's fear from the heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you are after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.